assurance comes not from looking at myself and seeing if I've got some something which has happened, though, though, please God, you will, but in looking away from myself and to the Jesus who walks around saying, don't be afraid, or get out of the boat then and follow me, or, or, or deny yourself and follow me, whatever it is. And as Jesus is perceived to be addressing us and as we're stepping out of the passage and embracing us, um, that's when uh, it isn't that we know because we know something about ourselves. We know because we know something about him. Welcome, everybody, back to the podcast. We've got another excellent episode for you today. My guest is the one and only N.T. Wright. Uh, Tom is currently a research fellow at Wycliffe College in Oxford, and he's also emeritus professor of New Testament and early Christianity at the University of St. Andrews, where I got to meet him. Uh, that's where I did my doctoral work, and I had the pleasure of being Tom's research assistant for two years. So really fun to catch up with him and talk about his new book, into the heart of Romans. I think you're absolutely going to love this book. Highly, highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite uh, Tom Wright books of recent memory, particularly among uh, his popular books that he has released. Romans 8, uh, favorite chapter of mine, favorite chapter of his. So a lot of fun uh, conversation around that role of the spirit in the Christian life, what assurance means. Um, what it means to be a human being, what the gospel is all about. So we have a really fun conversation. Tom's an awesome guy, and I know you're going to really enjoy uh, what he has to share. I think it's a real blessing. Uh, before we jump in, I do want to remind you that uh, the way to become a member of the Center for Bible Study is uh, through the link that I post in the description. It'll take you to our website, and you can make a donation, any dollar amount. It's just a recurring donation of whatever amount you feel like if you want to do one dollar great five dollars ten dollars doesn't matter it makes you a member and your membership um means that you get access to all of our Center for Bible Study classes. We're constantly doing these four to six week classes on various topics, currently um, in the heart of doing an atonement class. We also do uh, public lectures that will be recorded. So you get all the past recordings all there together for you to study and dig into along with all the class notes and PowerPoints. Then you also get access into all of our future classes. Uh, alongside that, we're going to give you a shout out on the podcast and uh, honor you there, um, as well as a monthly newsletter. So it's a really great deal. It's a way for you to support the work we do, not just in the YouTube channel and podcast, but also uh, in the, 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 with the center there. So I want to encourage you there. And lastly, if you are not uh, currently, please do make sure that you are subscribed and following us. Um, your subscription really helps us out in growing our platform. And uh, if you can, leave a comment, uh, anything along those lines. We love to interact there. So make sure you're subscribed, you have your notifications on, and definitely want to encourage you to consider becoming a member. I think it's a great opportunity to invest in, uh, in this community and um, really gets a gr great deal of uh, theological education for yourself for, uh, I think, a bargain price. So encourage you to, uh, to consider that. And with that, and without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our conversation with Tom. Welcome back, everybody, to the podcast. I'm so delighted to be joined today by Tom Wright. Uh, we're going to be discussing his new book, Into the Heart of Romans, which is uh, it's really a, a fantastic book. I can't recommend it highly enough. Tom's got the physical copy there. I'm still waiting on my physical copy to arrive, <laughs> but I was really privileged to endorse this book. I uh, can, can't endorse it highly enough. Uh, I said something along the lines of, you know, Tom is the great greatest biblical theologian of our day, and he's commenting on, in my opinion, Paul's greatest chapter that he ever wrote, perhaps. And so what what better, what more could we hope for, right? Um, the other really cool connection with this book is Tom dedicated it to our, our dear friend Peter Rogers, and that connects directly to the work we do, because this is the Center for Bible Study, and Peter was the founder of the center. His heart was to connect biblical studies to the life of the church, and uh, that's, we, we carry on his legacy here. So really, uh, uh, wonderful to see this book dedicated in his honor. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's it's really a treat. It's been a while since we've we've chatted it last, so it's it's always a treat. Um, I, I want to get into the book, but before we do, I, I'd love to just get a little bit of um, 
insight from you, if I may. And one of the, the questions I always like to ask my guests is how they kind of got into biblical studies. What, what did that path look like? And yeah, what, what motivated you to become a biblical scholar? I, I imagine there's a very long story behind that, so you don't have to give the whole long story. But if you could just give us a little bit of a picture, because I, a lot of people know Tom Wright, but they might not know the story of how Tom Wright became yeah. the scholar that he is today. There, there, there is, of course, a much longer story. And one of these days I might write it up. We'll see. I'm supposed to be writing some sort of a theological autobiography, but that's down the track somewhere. Um, I, I grew up in a church going family, a very ordinary middle class, middle of the road Anglican family in the far northeast of England. Um, church every Sunday. I sang as a little boy in the choir of our local parish church. So I was getting the Psalms all the time. And I was hearing, though not taking in very much, the Old and New Testament readings and just kind of going along with that very happily. When I was about 12, um, there was somebody from the Scripture Union who came to our school for some reason. It wasn't a specifically Christian school, but the, for some reason the school allowed this guy to come in and talk to the pupils. And he said, you know, you're about the age now when it might be a good idea to start reading your Bible. Here are some notes that would help you. And by the way, here are some summer camps which you might like to sign on for and to come to, and that would help you more. And I was I was absolutely ready for that. I started reading the Bible day by day then um, with the help of those Scripture Union notes. And I've never seen any reason to stop, um, though I don't use Scripture Union notes anymore because I've kind of made my own notes as I've gone along. But I also went to the camps which were, were there advertised and where little simple um, Bible expositions were given, morning and evening prayers, very short, very practical, very um, designed for teenage boys who were really eager to get back outside and climb a mountain or canoe or whatever we were doing. Um, but that it all it all went in and went quite deeply with me and uh, uh, made so much sense of so many other things that, that were going on in my life through my teens. Um, and then... Uh, I, I actually, probably because of my love of the Bible, I decided I really wanted to study classics. So I did mm -hmm. uh, Greek and Latin from quite an early age through my teens, and particularly the early Roman Empire, which is, of course, when the Roman uh, world was playing host all unknowingly to early Christianity. So when I came to Oxford and studied classics, that's a story in itself, uh, I ha always had half a mind on to, and this is the context of the New Testament, and wow, that's exciting for all sorts of reasons. Then one day, uh, just a, a few hundred yards from where I'm sitting now, here in central Oxford, um, there was a talk given to a bunch of us, and it was a talk about something else entirely. But in the Q&A, the man who was doing the talk um, John Wenham, who some may remember, he wrote a, a introduction to New Testament Greek, which used to be um, well known on the circuit, as it were. He said almost casually that for too long, people who loved the Bible and loved the Lord and loved the gospel had been playing catch up to the liberal scholarship, which had been going around saying, you can't believe that. And this bit never mm. happened. And that was written 200 years later. And blah, 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 blah. And he said that the, the believing scholars have been nervously padding along behind trying to disprove what the liberals are saying. And he said, you know, it's time to get on the front foot and for people who love the scriptures to get out in front and learn new things because there's masses more to discover and let the liberals do the catching up. And I remember like an electric shock going through me thinking, wow, that's a great vocation. I mean, I had known from an early age that I was called to ministry. That was kind of who I was and where I thought. I, so I assumed that I was going to be a parish priest like my grandfather and my uncle and various other family members. And indeed, this coming Sunday, I'm going to be preaching for the 50th anniversary of the ordination of my brother-in-law, who has been a parish priest all his working life. And I, I honour that vocation. But that, for me, was the transition where I suddenly thought, well, I know I'm to be a priest in the church. I want to be a preacher and teacher and pastor. But the heart of that has got to be the research on the scriptures and trying to... Um, forge new pathways without the slightest idea of what they might be. Um, and in a sense, from that moment, and that must have been about 1970, 71, something like that. Um, that's what I believe I was called to do. And, you know, it's very difficult when you think you have a vocation because that has to be tested over time. But sure. looking back now over 50 plus years, I think I can say, actually, I think that is what I've been doing. Although en route, 
to my surprise, there has been a bit of setting a new agenda and letting the Liberals catch up, but there's also been quite a lot of challenging some of the assumptions made in the evangelical world, both in Britain and America, the world which uh, in which I'd grown up, about what the gospel is, how it works, etc. And I've got into some hot water on both counts, and, and so be it, because the task is actually to understand the Bible better and, and, and to do so in public, so that it's always mm -hmm. open to people to come back and say, no, you're misreading this. And in some cases, as you, Max, will know, some of my own research students have said, <clears throat> despite what Dr. Wright says here, it is in fact the case that Paul does this and that. And I love those moments because when yeah. I was examining doctoral dissertations, I would always be a bit suspicious if half the footnotes were to the candidate's own supervisor. I would think, well, right. come on, have you not got any independent thoughts? So if one of my students, and you will know who I'm talking about, was saying, hmm, here's something which Wright seems to have ignored, then, wow, good, great, that's, what, that's how the discipline advances. And it's some of those insights which have helped me with some of the Romans 8 book, which we're mm. actually talking about. So, sorry, right. that's a very short that's version. That's wonderful. Of the yeah, no, I love that. I love that. A couple of thoughts that I had when you were talking is I, I've been doing a little bit more work in public spaces, and so I pay attention. And your name comes up from time to time. You know, people, you're, you're a big, famous scholar, and so people like to, um, you know, T take different angles on on things and if they can score points or whatever but sure. one of the things that always amuses me about that is knowing you you know um you love when people disagree with you actually and because sure. 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 it creates dialogue and um yeah it's um that that's one of the things i always loved about the seminars that we had at st andrews it was yeah. let's argue it out around the table and then let's go have a beer sure. at the pub and sure, we, sure. we we Absolutely. are still friends at the end of the day and i, I always Absolutely. really love that the other thing too that you said that really struck me is um there is definitely within the more theological conservative circles a reactionary fear-based tendency when it comes to biblical studies and yep. that has often set the agenda i would say just from my perspective, I think even more so in American evangelicalism. Um, yeah. I, I know it's the case in Britain as well, but one of the things I really appreciated about British scholarship was it wasn't just purely take over everything from Germany or reject everything from Germany. It was forge a new way in conversation with Germany, as it were. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, I, I appreciated that because I felt like there was just independent critical thinking, not all or nothing. And, and that was that was really wonderful. Um, Absolutely. I mean, somebody asked me the other day in an email, which books should I read? Which books do you think are setting out the right path for understanding Paul today? And I instanced some obvious things like obviously Richard Hayes and, and several others and Mike Gorman and so on. But I said, do you know what? I have learned even more from people like Kaiserman, with whom I disagree radically on some things, and Charles Cranfield, very, very different, with whom I disagree radically about other things. But figuring out when you read a sentence and think, I don't think that's right, but what is it that's wrong about it? And yeah. try to work that out. Those mm -hmm. are the real learning moments for me yeah and uh, once you sort of shed the fear <laughs> then then yeah there's there's all sorts yes. of possibilities open in front of you yes that's a good point i get book I, I request for book recommendations all the time as well and my my tension is always are they going to think when i recommend this book i'm endorsing everything in the book because many of the books i want to recommend are books that i really strongly disagree with on some points but they help stimulate right. my thinking and, exactly. and, and it, so Absolutely. when you ask a biblical Absolutely. scholar to recommend a book just keep that in mind everyone that yep, yep. Uh, we think about Absolutely. books in different ways sometimes <laughs> <laughs> um I, I wanted to ask you to uh one more question about yeah. that kind of theological education as you sit back and kind of reflect on your time, you know, studying in Oxford in the 70s with Caird and uh, Vermesh and some of these other great giants, and, and you kind of look back and think about where we are now today, a uh, very different time. Th theological education for some might feel like it's a, a bit of a cacophony in terms of different voices at the table, but maybe in a good way, you could look at it also as a, as a symphony, I suppose. It depends on what metaphor you want to use. Um, 
but also theological education is is in crisis in some ways in that higher education in general is in crisis uh the church in the west is in some ways declining in other ways not um but a lot of the established institutions that were typically the model through which theological education was delivered are facing new economic challenges and and so forth i'd just be curious to hear kind of your thoughts as both as you think about where biblical studies has gone in your the span of your career and then also what challenges you see on the horizon but maybe also hopes you have for biblical wow. studies wow yeah i mean i i try i've tried since leaving st andrews to step back from the detailed um, almost day to day or week to week week by week um, academic politics, um, whether it's college politics or, or within the discipline. And by I haven't, because of my health the last year, I haven't been to any conferences, so I haven't been listening to the buzz that's going on around. What I would say here in Oxford, I mean, this is slightly taking your question into a different area, but it's yeah. the best way I can answer it, I think. Um, here in Oxford, I'm attached to Wycliffe Hall, which is one of the Anglican seminaries here in Oxford. And I was in there this morning for morning prayers. I go in each day. The term has just begun this last week. And the chapel is full, a lively student body. Um, it's really exciting to feel these uh, bright young minds, most of them uh, young, and I think most of them bright as well, um, mm -hmm. coming in and offering for ministry and uh, ready to be trained. And my colleagues there uh, um, uh, teaching them and uh, one of them was half grumbling, half celebrating to me yesterday that there are so many students in his class. He's got twice the number of essays to read each week that he was expecting from last year. But he said, you know, that, that's a great thing because the, 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 the hall is thriving. Um, so that there's all sorts of good things happening. At the same time, I think there's been a confusion in Britain about what theology is, what academic theology is. And as always, and this goes way back, does biblical studies belong with something called theology or is it part of religious studies or how mm -hmm. does that all work? I don't see any emerging consensus there. Um, I hear a lot of voices, some of which I thoroughly approve of, some of which make me scratch my head a bit. Um, and I'm, I'm waiting to see who, as it were, the next generation is going to um, um, going to emerge because several of the people a little bit younger than me are coming up to retirement. I mean, people like John Barclay in Durham, um, people like my colleague here in Oxford, Marcus Bockmull. I don't know how long he's got to go, but it can't be that long before retirement, I imagine. Um, I wonder who the next generation are going to be. Um, are there any people making significant waves in the discipline? Um, George Van Coten, who's the New Testament prof in Cambridge, um, he's a brilliant, brilliant guy from yeah. from the Netherlands, but uh, now um, teaching in the UK. And uh, uh, so, he, I don't always again. I don't always agree with what George says, but my goodness, he's he's a leader. He's going places, and I hope and pray there will be more such. Um, but we need we need to keep our foot on the pedal, and we need to make it clear to the next generation. Um, not least people training for ordination or whatever, or the people who are doing a theology course, that this this the study of Scripture is one of the most intellectually, culturally, personally exciting things you could wish to do with your brain for the rest of your life. I mean, it just yeah. goes on being stimulating and challenging. And I think back to the something you said before, there has been a sort of standoff between biblical studies and theology, philosophical theology, systematic theology. And you're right, in America, this has often been conservative theologians holding aloof from what the Bible is actually all about and saying, well, what we really have to do is to go to the fourth and fifth century, to Nicaea, to Chalcedon, and then to- Or the maybe just skip to the 16th century. <laughs> No, or, or, or now, these days, to go to the Middle Ages, to Thomas Aquinas, uh, um, yeah. and, and to, to allow him to set the agenda. And there are many within the older evangelical world who, who are going that route. And I'm thinking, hang on, guys, what about this thing called the Bible, which you claim um, is your authority? And, and often, and I think the trouble is, I may have said this to you before, the trouble is that a lot of people, when they study theology, they do Bible in the first year, and 
they probably get dragged through all the old critical issues like J.E.D.N.P. for the Pentateuch, like the source criticism of the Synoptic Gospels, and they think, was it for this that I signed on to read theology? Mm -hmm. What's this got to do with God and the world and the gospel? And then they switch to um, the patristic period or the medievals or the Reformation, and they think, ah, this is more like it. This is the real stuff. And then the Bible becomes that funny stuff we did at the beginning, Mm -hmm. and so they refer back to it when they want to prove text, but they're not Mm -hmm. actually letting the Bible set the agenda. And what I'm still trying to do in this book and the other ones that I'm trying to write at the moment is to let the Bible set the agenda and to challenge some of the easy, facile, I think, assumptions of some of the systematic theologians. Now, because you know my Gifford lectures, you will see where that takes me within that debate. But that's a whole other topic, which which we've not got into today. Have you heard the expression before, uh, seminary is cemetery? Have you ever uh, heard anybody use that before? That that's pretty common that? in the U.S. Really? Yeah. I, I, really? I, I, what, what's funny is I was actually I was walking in today and I had this that that thought and what you were describing biblical studies as basically is it's morgue work. It's treating the text as a cadaver. So any wonder uh, if you're uh, uh. if you're treating the text in the morgue, you might feel like you're on the way to the cemetery afterwards. So, wow! Wow! But yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but you're right. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's an, it's a, it's a worry about history, um, the sort of uncontrollability of history, and the fact that history might tell you new things that you didn't expect, um, and particularly many people in conservative traditions are worried that if you let Jesus be a real human being, then you may somehow diminish his divinity, which mm-hmm. of course is flatly against Nicaea and Chalcedon, which insists Mm -hmm. on the full humanity, etc. But Mm -hmm. I go back to that line from Henry Chadwick, which I quoted in my Giffords, that if you started off with Nicaea and Chalcedon and said, now, they're talking about Jesus. Who who exactly was this Jesus? You would never guess from Nicaea and Chalcedon that Jesus was anything like what we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This savvy, friendly, funny, grieving, Um, sovereign but sensitive human being going around being kind to, as I've often said, old ladies, stray dogs and small children. You know, I mean, it's just there's a sense of the the thatness of the real Jesus, which is so much richer than what you would get from this very God and very man sort of thing, Mm -hmm. which I mean, very God and very man is fine as a shorthand, but it doesn't begin to get. And then when you say, with John one eighteen, no one has ever seen God, but the only begotten God who's in the bosom of the Father, he's revealed him. It's when we look at this Jesus, we find out who God is. And so mm. much theology has tried to do it the other way, said, let's start off by proving God and getting a classical picture of God with all the attributes that he's omnipresent and omnipotent and omni this and omni that. Phew. And then, oh, then, then there is Jesus who died for our sins. And mm-hmm. How does that actually work? And the Bible itself says, don't do it like that. In fact, you can't do it like that. You've got to go the Jesus route. And that's when people get scared because they're not sure they can control that. It may mm-hmm. not come out where they want. Anyway, that, again, is a whole other discussion, but it really, yeah. really is important right now. Yeah, no, that's really well said. The biggest thing I find that's a challenge for people is to take seriously the humanity of Jesus. Yeah, and, the, yeah. and that's connected to taking seriously the humanity of Scripture as well. Yeah, um, so those, those two things are really closely connected. Yep. I see yep. that. Yeah. Yep. All right. So let's let's get into the book then. It's been yep. what twenty years since you wrote a commentary on Romans uh, in the New International Commentary, and uh, um, and, and yes. now is that new, is, new, is that new, right? New interpreters. New, new interpreters. interpreters. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. New interpreters. Yeah. Yes. I think great series. Um, so why why now uh, a book on Romans eight in particular? I mean, I'm kind of setting oh. you up here. Obviously, we've had conversations before about our sure. love for Romans eight. So, but just for for our our audience and everything, it, it like was, what what is it about it, Romans eight that said you know? Humanly speaking, it was a happy accident. Part of the deal that I have with Wycliffe Hall, where I'm teaching part time, is that once a year I do a series of Bible expositions, which happen on Monday mornings for the whole college. And they come in, it's basically morning prayer, but it's almost entirely Bible exposition. So I did my first year there, I think I did Second Corinthians. My second year, I did Philippians. Um, And then I think this must have been my third year. Yes, it was my third year. I said to the principal, you know, I've done whole books, 
but it might be fun to take one chapter and actually go down right into the weeds and look at all the little words and all the meanings of individual words and show then how the jigsaw gets put back together again and encourage the students into the task of doing it that way for themselves. So I took a whole term, I think it was eight or possibly nine lectures, and I, I simply unpacked um, each section of Romans 8, the three or four verses at a time. And in doing that, I started to see all sorts of things which I hadn't seen when I was writing the commentary 20 years before. And of course, a lot had changed in that time, because when I wrote the commentary, um, I was only just beginning to think through what I would now loosely call temple theology in the New Testament. Um, and I was only just beginning to work out what it meant that in Romans 7 and 8, Paul is telling the story of Israel and the church as a continuous mm. whole, um, with uh, exile at the end of chapter 7 and then coming through into the rebuilding of the temple in chapter 8, so that when he talks about the indwelling of the Spirit, this is temple language, and the temple is then going to be rebuilt, hence the resurrection, and all of that, I needed to work that out. And then there was stuff which was bubbling up in the seminar in, in St. Andrews, about the meaning of the very dark passage um, of Romans eight eighteen to 28, which mm -hmm. so many people skip over because they assume that this is simply a, a dark tunnel you have to go through on the way to salvation without mm -hmm. real. And then, then the thing which really strikes me is that so many commentators, and I think I did it myself, treat the little passage on prayer in verses 26 and 27 as though it's just like a detached comment on prayer, as though mm. Paul is just tossing in a couple of lines about prayer, and rather puzzling lines at that, which is a way of saying we haven't yet understood the passage, because mm -hmm. actually that comment about prayer, about the, the wordless lament that arises from the heart that is indwelt by the Spirit, in the midst of the world that is in pain, this is the very heart of the Christian vocation. And, mm. and so verses 12 to 30 are about vocation, not salvation. Salvation is the larger whole. Within that, the vocation of the image-bearing Christian is to be the people who are in prayer at the place where the world is in pain, so, mm. that, the, so that God, the Holy Spirit, may be right there in that place. Uh, interceding to the Father, and thereby uh, creating us according to the pattern, the image of Jesus himself, that cruciform shape. So it, it, it's like the, those verses, verses 26 and 27, are a kind of Pauline equivalent of the cry of dereliction on the cross in Matthew and Mark, my God, why did you abandon me? The spirit at the heart of the world in, that is in pain is wordlessly lamenting. And as I think I say in the book, when even the third person of the Trinity has no words to say how awful things are, mm. then you know things are pretty bad. But that's what's going on in order that creation as a whole may be redeemed. And when I was doing those lectures in, um, whenever it was, a year and a half ago, was just coming up the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, here is a very obvious place where the world is in pain. What are we supposed to be doing there? We're supposed to be in lament because there are no words to say how terrible this is, like many other things in the world. Sorry, I'm I'm getting launched on a sermon now, but you see where I'm going. I love it. Yeah, no, I love it. We had the second episode I did on the podcast was with a Psalm scholar, my colleague here at the oh. university, and we spent a, quite a bit of time talking about lament. And that's, it's yeah. been interesting. That's been a theme that's come up several times with different guests. Um, because yeah. I think yeah. a lot of people are sensing that this is, uh, well, first of all, you know, the scriptures and the Psalms in particular give us these really rich resources for practicing mm. this well. But it's mm. like we haven't, at least in many traditions, haven't really taken seriously that this is part of our vocation as Christians yeah. to yeah. step yeah. into this space of lament. That's exactly right. I mean, uh, I, I have enjoyed in a measure the culture of worship songs I, I still love the old hymns and I love properly sung psalms and so on. But there is something very refreshing about particularly young people coming in and simply praising God uninhibitedly. And again and again, the worship songs are praising him for salvation, for rescuing us, etc., etc. And I was thinking the other day, do you know, lament is itself paradoxically part of worship because mm -hmm. 
as we are worshipping God the Creator, God the Life-Giver, we are doing so as people whose feet are very firmly in the suffering world. And when we are then worshipping God, who is the lover of the world, who made the world and loves it and has redeemed it in Christ and is redeeming it by the Spirit, then it's totally appropriate, precisely as part of worship, not as an aside from worship, to say, and by the way, things are a fair old mess right now. Mm -hmm. And as we worship you, we trust that you are aware of this and that you are going to act. Like the psalmist saying, come on, Lord, wake up. Why are you still asleep? Right. In Psalm 44, which Paul uh, alludes to a couple of times in Romans 8. Um, right. and, and so uh, finding ways of nesting appropriate lament within appropriate worship without people feeling as though the steam has just gone out of the worship service because suddenly everyone's gone sad. You know, that, that, that wouldn't be the point. The point is we're bringing all of life into the presence mm. of God. And part of that is bound to me. And I've often said to the students, when you're preaching or leading worship, when you look down at a congregation from your perch on the podium or whatever, every face you see is hiding some secret sorrow. And they may not want to tell you about it just yet, but recognize that that is in fact the case. And that when we lament, we are enabling those people to bring that into their worship as well. That's really, really important as part of part of normal Christian life, I would say. Mm -hmm. That's uh, it's really well said. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad uh, that that uh, we were able to hear that from you because I think that's just so so important. Um, okay, so I want to get into a couple of details yeah. that you get that sure. you draw out in Romans eight, but maybe just before, if we could just real quickly take a step back. Romans is obviously this is important sprawling book. People often treat it as like Paul's summa, you know, of his of his theology and. There's all these different kind of approaches to Romans, but one really popular way of treating Romans, especially in the evangelical circles, is this Romans road kind of piecemeal fashion. Um, yeah. It's a yeah. kind of way of trying to articulate the gospel yeah. using tidbits of Romans. What what What's the danger of kind of piecemealing Romans and where do you actually see the, the flow of the argument and where Romans 8 falls into that? Yeah, I mean... I, I, I need to be careful because there are a lot of people who are Christians today because somebody sat them down and walked them through the Romans road and yep. they believed and thanked God for it. And they may have moved into quite different places now, but um, I'd much rather people were doing that than that they were being told, oh, you can't believe anything these days or you ought to be a Buddhist or whatever, you know. No, um, if the Romans road is about the God who made the world, about Jesus dying for you, and about this meaning that God is reaching out in love to embrace you and you have to respond with faith, well, great, let's do it. But then, now let's take a deep breath and actually see what it is talking about. And the danger, and th this is where, of course, I'm fully expecting to be labeled as a heretic yet again, is that the, the thing I'm trying to write a book about at the moment, it's in bits on my desk at the moment, um, is is the the basic insight that most Western Christians think that the aim of the game is to go to heaven when you die or for your soul to go to heaven when you die. Most Western non-Christians think that's what Christianity is all about as well. But yeah. that's simply wrong, that the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is about God wanting to come and dwell with his human creatures within his renewed creation. So that the strap line at the end of the book of Revelation isn't the dwelling of humans is with God, it's the dwelling of God is with humans. And the aim is not, as with disciples of Thomas Aquinas, that the soul should go on its way on its long journey and finally end up glimpsing the face of God. Jesus, when asked, uh, please will you show us the Father? Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that, that is the message of John's Gospel and actually of the whole New Testament. If you want the beatific vision, look hard at Jesus. So now, the Romans road is predicated on the Western assumption that what's stopping us getting all the way up to heaven is that we're sinners, God needs to deal with our sins so that we can get there. Whereas the Old Testament sacrificial system and the New Testament reappropriation of that round Jesus is all about how God deals with our sin, not so that we sinners can get to heaven, but so that God can come and dwell with us, because he mm -hmm. can't dwell with us if we're still sinful. And that's how sacrifices work. They cleanse the, the temple, the worshippers, so that God may come and dwell. So that already 
there's a significant shift. And we see that working out in what we call in the trade Christology and pneumatology. The picture of Jesus is God with us, as in Matthew, but also in Paul and all over the place. The picture of the Spirit is also God with us and in us, so that the Spirit isn't simply the one who comes to give us a nudge and to give us a, a slightly happier time while we're waiting to go on to heaven. The Spirit is, if you like, this is what God always intended for his own other self, his own third self, if I can put it like that. God always wanted to come and dwell in and with his human creatures. And that's the glory of, of, of Romans 5 to 8, especially Romans 8, so that um, the Romans road is much better and bigger and in some way darker than we might have imagined, because it isn't just, oh dear, I'm a sinner. Phew, God has sent Jesus. Um, he died, therefore I go to heaven. It's no, we are sinful. But the problem with our sin is that it's it's not just it's holding us back from going to heaven, it's stopping us being genuine humans. Mm. And in Romans mm -hmm. 5, Paul says, those who receive the gift of righteousness will reign in life. This is the theme of the royal priesthood, which you find all the way from Exodus 19 to Revelation 20. Um, this is the image-bearing humans who are to be representing the praises and prayers of the world before God and representing the wise stewardship of God over his creation. That is the human vocation. And the reason we're set free from our sins is not so that we can lie back and do nothing forever. It's so that we can be genuine humans at last. But the present mode of that genuine humanness includes, as I said before, the dark passage through the lament in which the spirit intercedes with us and for us and for the world with inarticulate groanings. So the, mm. the glorious picture of Romans 8 is the end of the, of the real Romans road of, of Romans 1 to 8 anyway. Of course, what mm. then happens is that Paul has now set himself up to address the two big areas. One, the whole covenant relationship with Israel, and two, who are we then called to be as the church? But mm. that Romans road is all about God coming to dwell with us in the Messiah mm. and by the Spirit. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So the kind of the w w I'd like to d drill down a little bit for people. I, I think I have a good sense of what you mean by true human, but I think it'd be great to unpack that. Like what what is going on here? Um, Paul says in Romans eight towards the end, um, right before the big assurance passage, we're being conformed into the image of Christ. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that seems to me to be right that when we think about salvation right especially in the tradition that i'm familiar with yeah, you know american yeah, yeah. evangelical traditions salvation is almost always articulated as a past event we we say things like i got saved and yeah, yeah, yeah. what paul is saying here is well our final destination is full conformity to the image of christ and what you're talking about here with vocation is really participation in that kind of humanity, which I think you're yeah, glossing yeah. is true humanity. So how right. does that work for Paul in, in Romans? Right, right. Well, as you know, I go back to the whole idea of the image of God in Genesis 1, and I read that the same way that Old Testament scholars like Richard Middleton read it, that the image is like the angled mirror reflecting God into the world and reflecting the world back to God. So the sovereignty of God over the world, that's the royal bit of the royal priesthood, and then the prayers and praises and laments of the world being passed on back to the creator, as it were. So the mirror is operating in both directions. But the point about the image then is that creation is a temple, a heaven plus earth structure with an image at its heart. Anyone in the ancient world would know that was a temple. And if it's the temple, then uh, when God remakes the temple, which is Jesus and his people together, as we see in the temple theology in John and Paul and, and Revelation in the New Testament, then uh, we are called to be the image bearers at the heart of that new temple. And part of the point of that is that humans are to enable the church to be the church. And the church, just like the temple in the Old Testament was a sign and foretaste of new creation, and this is a major insight which has been bubbling up all over the place in scholarship over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and I think just in a sidebar, the reason we've missed it up till now is that in much Protestant theology, the temple has sounded too churchy or possibly mm -hmm. too Jewish, 
possibly too Roman Catholic, so people haven't wanted to go there. But actually, once we get over those hang-ups and see what's really going on, this is an enormously exciting way of approaching biblical theology. And it means that humans are designed to play a God-given and God-enabled active role within God's purposes in and for the world. In other words, humans are not simply passive creatures who either are sinful or going to be rescued from sin, end of conversation. Humans are designed to be God's means of working in the world. So in Genesis 1, when God makes humans in his own image, it's so that he can then work through them. God wants to work through humans. I, I'll tell you a funny story, which I'm going to use in a sermon on Sunday night because it's germane to this. A few months ago, uh, two of my grandchildren were sitting at our lunch table and the six-year-old Leo um, uh, said, Grandpa, if God does everything, why do we have to do anything at all? And while I was thinking, oh my goodness, great question, he, he bubbled over and he said again, if God is responsible for everything, why should we be responsible for anything? At which point his sister, who was 11, um, who had had her nose in a book like this, she lifted her head from the book and said, ah, the illusion of free will and dived, dived straight back into the book again. Uh, you know, it was with the tone of voices. Oh, we did that in second year, you know. Um, but, but I thought that's such a great question because so many Christians think that either God does something or we do it. And if we're saying God is great and he does everything, then we sit back, put on dressing gown and slippers and we're just sort of riding along. But actually, the whole point of making humans in God's image is because God wants to work in and through humans. And the reason he does that in Genesis 1 is because God makes a world in which it will be utterly appropriate for him to come himself in the person of the second person of the Trinity and to mm. become human as the utterly appropriate thing for him to do and then to send his spirit to enable, as in Genesis 2 already, to enable human beings to become his partners in his project, first of creation and then ultimately a new creation. And so when I see that verse, Romans eight twenty nine about um, we're, we're to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among a large family, Jesus as the human being, the firstborn among this family of humans who are at last becoming what humans were meant to be, partners with God in the work of new creation. That's a wonderful vocation. And of course, it's difficult for us because if you stop and look in the mirror and think, goodness, is God the Spirit at work in me right now? Help, what's that going to look like? Then it might paralyze you um, with a sense of inadequacy or whatever Paul says, who is sufficient for these things, which is why I say to people, before everything that you do, as you mentioned before, you pray, you invoke the Spirit, you pray and you trust, and then you use all the powers of mind and body and spirit that God has given you to do the task that lies before you. And you trust that even though it may be flawed in various ways, God the Spirit will be present and will work through you. So that that's what I see going on there. But you need this big picture of what it means to be image bearers, which then carries you right the way through. Mm, that's beautiful. One of the ways that you mentioned the book that you're thinking has evolved also along with Temple, it's, I mean, it's intimately connected with it. It's this theme of glory and yeah, yeah. Um, how that how that ties in. I mean, we, we, we often think about glorification in kind of abstract terms, like we're going to be glorified with Jesus. What does that mean? Um, it seems to me, and I, from what I hear you saying, I think we are agree in agreement on this. It has it has both an ontological and a vocational dyna uh, 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 dimension to it. The two can't yes. really be separated. It, so what, what what's going on with glory with glory language here? Because I mean, Paul says early on, right? They the uh, the the wrath of God is poured out on human beings. They've they've exchanged the the you know the glory of God for yep, these yep. images, and then Romans three twenty three. Um, you know, we, yeah. we, we've all, we all, all fall short or lack, lack or are bereft of the glory of God. So glory yeah. seems to be this theme running throughout. Yeah. I don't like fall yeah. short because it seems like glory is the sort of standard we have to like measure oh, up yes. to, but I think it's, I it's more than that for, for Paul. It's, um, it's an actual, uh, yeah. Ontological reality that, that we, we, yeah. we've turned from God's God's yeah. glory and that yeah. leads yeah. to a downfall in our own glory and action. Um, 
Yeah. But yeah, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. It, it's a funny thing because my own supervisor, Professor George Caird, wrote his doctoral dissertation on glory in the New Testament. And uh, that's that's never been published. Interestingly, it's, it's a very detailed technical word study, but then some theological conclusions coming out of it. Um, and I gave a copy of that to um, uh, one of my students who you will remember, Haley Gorenson Jacob, as she oh, now yeah. is, who's now teaching not so far from where you are, uh, further north, Whitworth College in Washington State. Um, and uh, uh, Haley ran with it into her dissertation, which was on Romans 8. And she was emphasizing the way in which their glory is picking up the theme from Psalm 8, where Psalm 8 says, what are humans? You've made them little lower than the angels to crown them with glory and honor, putting all things in subjection under their feet. In other words, this is part of the human vocation to be the ones vested with God's sovereignty over the world. And Haley followed that through in her dissertation, which is now published, and I refer to it in the book. At the same time, uh, an old dear friend of mine, Kerry Newman, who now works for Fortress Press, he did his dissertation on glory, and he was emphasizing the divine glory revealed in Jesus, revealed in the resurrection, the sense of divine glory bursting into the world apocalyptically and doing new things and transforming reality, etc., etc. And I've said to both of them often, uh, I think we need to have both, actually. Um, and both of them uh, have resisted this. It's funny because I did <laughs> some lectures on the same Romans 8 passage in Texas um, 18 months ago, or 15 months ago now. And I, it was in Waco, and I was actually staying with Kerry and his wife, Leanne, while I was doing these. And so Kerry and I were discussing this and, and still not agreeing. But that, that, that's, this is how scholarship works. You, you live with these tensions. But so the point would be this. When you talk about the hope of glory in the first century, and Paul talks in Romans 5 about we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. If you say to a Jew, what is the hope of glory? They'll take you back to Isaiah chapter 40, um, that, that uh, the, 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 all flesh shall see the glory of God. Um, the, the, glory, the, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. And it becomes clear, this is Yahweh returning to Zion. This is what it's going to be when Yahweh, after the exile, comes back to Jerusalem at last. Uh, Isaiah 52, you, the watchmen will lift up their voices and shout for joy because they see the glory of God returning to Zion. They never say it's happened, but Isaiah and Malachi and people say it will happen. Um, and because of the new temple theme in Romans 8, it seems to me that's utterly appropriate that the glorification is the Spirit coming, as in Second Corinthians 3, the Spirit coming to enable the divine glory to dwell in and with God's people so that they really do constitute the new temple. But at the same time, this is the fulfillment of Psalm 8, because when human beings are vested with the glorious divine spirit, then they become the Psalm 8 people who are set in authority over the world. And these two belong together. This is why the way in which pneumatology directly reflects Christology. The mm -hmm. divine and human are made for one another so that mm -hmm. it's got to be both. So that for me, one of the big um, transformations of my reading of Romans 8 is those he justified them he also glorified does not mean when you've said a prayer so that you now know you're saved that means you're going to heaven heaven is not mentioned in this passage indeed the inheritance of the Christian in this passage is not heaven it's the new creation that's very clear mm -hmm. um, and when he says those he justified them he also glorified this is a direct echo of the Greek version the Septuagint of Isaiah 45 when it's it's the vocation of Israel as the people of God to be the ones in whom God's glory comes to dwell so that they will be his agents, his vicegerents, if you like, in then looking after his world and bringing about his new creation, which at a stroke undercuts a lot of the debates which the church has had for hundreds of years about predestination and election, focused on verses 29 and 30. So there's all sorts of new things which are bubbling mm -hmm. up when we read this the way that I'm convinced Paul was writing it. Yeah, that's great. And I think we see the the role of the Spirit throughout, as you know, as you were mentioning. I, there seems to me there's a, there's several moves of 
the spirit being the one that leads, so being led by the spirit, having the mind or the mindset that that's that's of the spirit. The spirit is the spirit of God, which is the spirit of Christ. Um, the spirit is, as we mentioned, the one that provides the mind of God to the believer, but then also even when the believer is unable, reflects the mind of God back to God in prayer and lament. And yeah. then the spirit provides the assurance to the believer of the resurrected and enthroned Christ. So it's like we got like the whole kind of framework of the Christian life there in some ways, yep. which is really, yep. really exciting. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts about how the spirit is here empowering um people to yes. walk and to live out as paul says the 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 telos of god's yeah. god's good instruction in in the law yeah. even yeah i mean one of the things that came to me very powerfully when i was doing these expositions was the the moral rigor of chapter 8 verses um 5 through 9 particularly where he's talking about the mind of the flesh is hostile to god doesn't submit to God's law. Indeed, it can't. Very interesting that. Um, but you are, but you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit. Now, of course, he doesn't mean that we've ceased to be physical people. Um, he's using in the flesh there in the sort of restrictive sense of determined by mm -hmm. the sarx, which is the human nature, which is corruptible and decaying and inclined to sin, etc. We are not determined by that. We are determined by the spirit, which is a huge challenge and goes on being, I think, throughout our lives. But then mm -hmm. in eight verses 12 and following, it's in a sense even more rigorous. We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. If you are determined to live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, this actually puts a question mark against the kind of easygoing doctrine of assurance, which says, mm -hmm. oh, I put my hand up in a meeting when I was 14 years old, therefore I'm going to heaven, whatever else I do. And the answer is, um, have another look here, because unless by the Spirit this is ongoing, then the very fact of whatever happened when you were 14 years or older, whenever it was, might be called into question, because if that was real, then the Spirit ought to be dwelling in you, and if the Spirit's dwelling in you, then there has to be moral change, moral, um, moral living. And that, that, that remains a challenge, as I say, you know, as a preacher and pastor myself, remains a challenge for me, remains a challenge to everyone to whom I've ever been a pastor. But you can't write it out of Romans 8 just because we believe in justification by faith and no condemnation. Paul is very clear, no condemnation. But then the no condemnation is because of the Spirit's work. The law of the Spirit of life in Messiah Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death etc 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 what god has done in christ and is now doing by the spirit backs up that no condemnation so mm -hmm. you can't have the no condemnation which is justification without having the work of messiah and the spirit and if the spirit then that moral challenge which comes so powerfully in particularly 8 12 to 15 really yeah no that that's really well said and I've often thought to, I think the reason why so many Christians over the course of church history and today have read their own experience into the latter part of Romans 7 is precisely because it is a challenge and it, 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 it takes out, it takes ongoing work and rigor and submission to the spirit. Mm -hmm. the, the, the difference is, is chapter seven, the I there is quite defeated <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, and, and that's not the, 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 the call of the, the Christian life precisely yeah. because for Paul, the spirit is at work in the, in the it, life of the believer. It, exactly. I mean, th this was a big shift for me in the late 1970s because through the 1970s, when I was doing my main original work on Romans. I was with Cranfield and Dunn, who were saying Romans 7, 7 to 25 is a picture of the Christian life. Because mm -hmm. uh, if you have anything else, you become arrogant. If you think you've left Romans 7 behind, watch out, you're fooling yourself because actually you, you are still sinning and you never become sinlessly perfect, perfected in this life. And, and if you'd grown up with people preaching 
um, oh, you can have this second blessing and then you'll never sin again in your life. If you'd grown up with that preaching, you probably needed an antidote to it. Um, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Baptist in the Victorian era, was very hot on this. This is, mm -hmm. this is not about um, becoming sinlessly perfect. But the problem is that's not what Romans 7 is about. Mm -hmm. We, I think particularly in the last 400 years in the Protestant West, we have been looking for either an ordo salutis or a kind of a theological description of stages in the Christian life, like people going back to Acts chapter 2 and saying, oh my goodness, this is Pentecost. Have I had that Pentecostal experience? Mm -hmm. uh, or when, this, when Peter and John go to Samaria and lay hands on them, have I had the experience as a Samaritan? That's not what Acts is about. That's right. a very modern set of questions. In the same way, to read Romans 7 and 8 that way is simply misleading. Romans 7, 7 to 25 is, I, I now see completely clearly, I think, I think, is Paul's description as a Christian of the theological position of Israel according to the flesh, which because it was Paul's own position, and in a sense he is still, because these are his kinsfolk according to the flesh, he doesn't want to say them or they, he says I, in order to identify with that plight. Um, so it's a, it's a very clever piece of writing, but it hmm. seems to me clearly that that's the way you've got to go. Anyway, um, I do spend a bit yeah. of time on that because, after all, yeah. the first word of Romans 8 in most English no translations condemnation. Is, yeah. is, no, no, it's therefore, is therefore. Yes. Yes. If you say therefore, we need to know what, what went immediately before and how, how right. all that works logically. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you're not persuaded by those who argue that the, the I there is, um, I mean, there's different ways of thinking about it, but, but there's one way to think about it is the I is um, a Gentile convert who is trying to take on the law as a sort of moral no, therapy. Yeah. No, no. I, I mean, there's been a fashion at the moment, as you will know, um, and it's partly associated with those who call their movement Paul within Judaism, which yes, is a correct. Yeah. I, spent, I spent my life studying the world of ancient Judaism and putting Paul into the middle of it. So, uh, you know, excuse me, by what right do you guys have, have that title all to yourselves? But but there's been a desperate push to make Paul um, uh, simply say this gospel is great for Gentiles, but of course Jews can stay as good Jews and that's okay too. I mean, that's people like Paula Fredrickson and so on. And that has been very popular because it seems to be post-Holocaust sensitivities about Jewish people, etc., which I, I totally understand. That's where I began in my whole Pauline studies, really, was with an awareness of that question. But when you have Romans 2.17 following, um, if you call yourself a Jew, um, the idea that this might be a Gentile who is calling him or herself a Jew and that Paul is critiquing them takes no account of what Paul is doing exegetically there. He's working with the Old Testament, which is critiquing Israel in exile and so on, with Ezekiel and Jeremiah and so on. And, and then all the way to the great climax of Romans in Romans 15, um, and 14 and 15, but 15, 1 to 13, welcome one another, therefore, as the Messiah welcomed you, Jews and Gentiles, so that you may with one heart and voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For Paul, this is the single family and it's Jews and Gentiles together. So all these different attempts to say, oh, this isn't really about Jews, it's really about Gentiles. I, I just think it doesn't you reject work those, yeah. Yeah. And, and I can see why people find that attractive. It's interesting that part of that movement are some who are themselves agnostics or atheists who I think are trying to reduce Paul's gospel to saying, oh, here's a way of spirituality, which if it suits you, fine, and if it doesn't, that's fine too, sort of thing. And and that's that's just a nonsense. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm quite glad I'm not taking part in those debates at the moment because I, I would get quite fed up with it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's up, yeah, it's up to you guys. You the next yeah, generation. Yeah, well, no, it's good. Me. It's good to hear your your thoughts on that. I know Paul Sloan, whom we both we both know, obviously, uh, oh, yeah. he just published yeah. an article in um, JTS. Um, coming back to this Romans 2 issue, and he's got a very interesting argument that it is, in fact, he takes a lot of, I mean, he he, he says he learns a lot from the Paul within Judaism approach and that, you mm -hmm. know, but he, he rejects that, that, that that's a Gentile, the so-called Jew. Uh, sure. And what his argument is, is that Paul Paul is arguing basically against a Jew who's standing 
uh, in the the sort of the, that final generation, as it were, um, yeah. the, that where there's the final hardening kind of uh, thing. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I yeah, have yeah. to interact more with him, but uh, but is but is an interesting kind of interesting. way uh, my, of carrying my, forward the conversation. My colleague, my colleague Peter Head, who teaches New Testament at Wycliffe, was telling me yesterday he's had an article accepted, I think, in the journal New Testament Studies. Um, on the Romans 15 passage, precisely making the point that I just made, which is actually echoing him, about the, the mutual welcome of Jews and Gentiles within the one body of Christ. Mm. But oh, that's great. he's making yeah. that, being Peter, he's doing that on linguistic as well as other grounds. Which oh, I'm that's, looking that's forward wonderful. To be, yeah, I look forward to seeing that. Yeah, I, it was funny too. I wanted to, your, your point about, um, you know, the the whole order salutis and getting all these kind of things together. I think the last 400 years, if they've taught us anything, it's that moving justification to the beginning of the process or, um, um, or, or saying that the works are, are the evidence of the faith that save us. Neither of those things really assuage the anxiety of people. <laughs> they might even heighten it in some ways. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I think that we have enough data now for hundreds of years to show us that. So, yeah, it, yeah. It, we we may need to kind of just be willing to move beyond that and and That's embrace very that. Interesting. You know. Yes, I mean I have often heard people talking about justification by faith as though if you really believe it, you will never have any anxieties uh, about anything. Which of course isn't true to Paul either, because Paul had several anxieties, which is quite clear. Even though he tells us not to, he himself did, and he talks about it. But but out beyond that. Um, it's clear in Romans that justification is both future and present. You know, mm -hmm. they will be justified, chapter 2. Mm -hmm. then, then the verdict is brought forward into the present. But then in Romans 8, we're looking ahead to the future law court. Um, it, it, it is God who justifies who is to condemn. Um, yeah. And one of the things that came out to me in this book particularly was the assurance not just uh, of, yes, you'll go to heaven when you die, or indeed the proper version of that, which is, Yes, you will be raised from the dead on the last day when God renews the whole creation. But also, you in Rome at the moment, who I think Paul prophetically senses that horrible persecution is likely to land on them any minute now, as indeed it did within a decade of him writing this letter, um, the Neronian persecution, that, that, that he's saying you know, neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor rulers nor this nor that, nothing can separate. In other words, it's an assurance about when you're going through suffering and trouble, when you're this tiny little group uh, meeting for prayer dangerously in the back room of somebody's shop or in an, an, a tenement that might catch fire any minute, you know, think of the, the grotty parts of ancient Rome, um, then nevertheless, if God is for us, who can be against us? And so it's a kind of practical assurance mm -hmm. that we here in this room, in praying for the Spirit to be with us, can know that whatever happens, whatever they throw at us, um, th this is who we are, and God is for us. And that that's a wonderful thing, which I think of you know, devout Christians at the moment in China or Ukraine or Syria or um, uh, Ethiopia or wherever. Boy, do they need this message right now. And we in the comfortable West, we shiver in our shoes as we think of what they must be going through. But actually, we need to be sympathizing with them and praying these passages on their mm -hmm. behalf, like we pray the lament psalms on their behalf, as that's what assurance is. It's not just, do I know that I'm going to heaven? It's, mm -hmm. it's do I know that in all these things we are more than conquerors? That, that's mm -hmm. the real nub of it. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, the, your stuff on assurance in the book is really, really awesome, um, theologically and pastorally. Uh, would you say that for Paul, assurance is really as simple as looking to the person of Jesus, looking at the love of God poured out in the Messiah Jesus, and yeah. and then so when we think about you know challenges and various things, what it what it does is it it calls us back to, for lack of a better term, the Christ event and forward yeah. to as you just suggested to solidarity with others who are presently in the groaning. Yeah. Uh, of all creation. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I had an email from somebody yesterday who asked me various complicated theological questions, one of which was something about how can I know that I have really repented and stuff like that. And and eventually, I, looking at that, I said, yeah, just stop looking at the mirror and asking what you look at, what, what the inside of yourself looks like. Turn it the other way around and just read passages from the Gospels and ask God 
to make the living Jesus real to you through those passages mm. in the Gospels. Because assurance comes not from looking at myself and seeing if I've got some something which has happened, though, though, please God, you will. But in looking away from myself and to the Jesus who walks around saying, don't be afraid or get out of the boat then and follow me or, or, or deny yourself and follow me, whatever it is. And as Jesus is perceived to be addressing us and as we're stepping out of the passage and embracing us, um, that's when uh, it isn't that we know because we know something about ourselves. We know because we know something about him. And, and that's kind of, it seems to me, that's part of the rhythm of genuine Christian life and all, always needs to be. Yeah. And it's not, assurance is not the same thing as certainty, right? I, no, I think no, that's no, no. a lot, a lot of people struggle with wanting, wanting certainty. They want, like, I, I need all my questions answered, right? Or we have a whole yeah. apologetics industry I around know. basically assuring people we've got an answer for everything. So <laughs> if you're not a Christian, you must be an idiot. <laughs> but but right. in fact, it's not the yeah. same thing, right? I, I think I think this is an American problem. I think the American rationalist tradition, which is a noble tradition, which I honor and respect, nevertheless, it has maintained a certain kind of energy in America, which it doesn't have in the rest of the world, certainly not in Britain right now. And that rationalist energy precisely is wanting the certainty. And people will say, well, if God is God, he must want us to be certain. Um, and the answer is no. According to the New Testament, because God is God, he wants us to be faithful. And mm -hmm. being faithful means hanging in there in the dark as often as not. Um, uh, and uh, of course, there are times when things are so clear and answers to prayer come in such a way that you simply can't doubt them. Um, mm. But when that happens, it's often because you are then going to go through another day or week or year or decade when you might be tempted to doubt it and you've mm. needed that moment of clarity in order mm. to look back to it and say, I, I knew then, I'm hanging on to that. God did guide us in this direction and so we've yeah. got to go. Um, yeah. And uh, that's not certainty. That's 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 loyalty, which is a very different thing. Yeah, loyalty, faith. Yeah, I, I was uh, thinking a lot of life. Actually, we have moments of life that maybe feel like Good Friday, and some moments yeah. of life, thank God, that feel like Resurrection Sunday. But probably most of life feels like Holy Saturday, which is <laughs> yes. that in between of yes. lingering and questions and. Yeah. What is this? Where are we going with this? You know, and yeah. um, and faith is 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 that allegiance we hung we hang on yeah. to the Messiah Jesus in that. Yeah, that's great. That's really that's wonderful. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd I'd love to ask you fifty more questions, but I want to honor <laughs> your time and just say thank well, you so much, um, Tom, for taking the time to bless our audience. Um, thank you for writing this book. I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, it has my recommendation on the book, so you can you can read it there. But um, but but yeah, yeah I just so really, really, um, really enjoyed enjoyed it. The when I saw the email from the publisher, Tom Wright's got a book coming out on Romans eight. My heart skipped a beat because <laughs> yeah, again, my favorite chapter in the whole Bible and uh, my favorite scholar. So yeah, <laughs> well, thank you're you. You're very kind. You're very kind. Thank you, uh, Max. Thank you very much. It's great to talk to you again, and I hope it won't be too long before we do this again. And in Sounds the meantime, good. God bless you and God bless your listeners, readers, whatever. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please make sure you subscribe using the link below and check out some more of our videos.